Right, okay, now this lesson is for um, year 12 A level and it's based on the work this week on the Andover Workhouse Scandal. Now, this is a real case study that the exam board want you to focus on based on the work we've been doing on pauperism. And what you need to understand with this, with this um, side of the course is how did Andover, this, the scandal at Andover, Andover, cause a significant change to the whole concept of workhouses? Now, obviously, so far, we've looked at the old poor law, we looked at old, the old poor relief, we've looked at the problems of things like the Spean Hamlin system, we've looked at the, uh, the reliance on outdoor relief. We then looked at a bit more detail into the Poor Law Amendment Act of 1834 and how that had a significant impact on changes. Now, the way in which it had a change was down that utilitarian um, idea of Jeremy Bentham, not so much the idea of keeping people as happy as possible, but the concept of workhouses. Where workhouses became very focused and central on healing with paupers. Now, you've done a little bit of work on recalling workhouses, but after 1834, what the, what the government had aimed with their, with their Amendment Act was to make it more of a universal usage to make sure that workhouses did the same things. Now, just as a reminder, you could voluntarily go into a workhouse. You weren't forced there. It was only at a point where you believed that you were at a pauper status, that you couldn't just you couldn't continue with everyday life. You know, it was that it was that final straw for a pauper. And by 1834, obviously, that had maybe increased slightly because of the removal of outdoor relief. Now, some people, um, some parishes had developed it further, but as we say, we're going to look at what happened at Andover and why it was so serious. We're going to look at the factors that caused it. We're then going to go through the questions that you were given um, for your lesson. And then I'm going to use an example that one of you have done um, on the exam question. That I think it's a pretty solid example. And just go through it to look at the structure of writing. So this is what you were given, the scandal at Andover. So firstly, you needed to know about the regime and then you needed to know about the scandal itself and how it was brought about. So what was life like at Andover? I'm going to go through each of these. I'm going to go through and might annotate a few things. So the first thing, established in 1836, and in the main purpose was to deter the poor. Now, just as a key word there, which I'm going to add in, deterring the poor was a way of basically putting off the poor, stopping them from being poor, which sounds horrendous. OK, how do you stop a group from being poor? Well, it's very, very difficult. OK, but. That's what that keyword deter means. It wasn't really there to help the poor. OK, now the whole concept of a workhouse was a way of punishing the poor. OK, so by deterring the poor, it was a way of stopping them from being poor. But it's a way of basically punishing. And this is why. Workhouses were also nicknamed prisons for the poor. After the 1834 Amendment Act, workhouses became central to the new poor law. Um, the reason for this is because the government actually thought it would be a better system than outdoor relief. Now, the problem with the workhouses straight off here was they were very, very expensive, especially universally. They were expensive to run, expensive to build. And also you had to keep the people inside the workhouse fed, clothed, you know, provide them with work. So this was going to cause big problems. Now the person who was in charge at Andover Workhouse was Colin McDougall. Great name. His past was as a sergeant major in the military. Now that means he's going to be a tough guy. He's fought in the Battle of Waterloo. He was the overall master of the house. It was going to be run a lot more militantly than others possibly. Because of his background, he was going to be strict. He was literally going to take this deterrent of the poor a lot more seriously than some people. This concept here, deterring, that's what he would have done a lot, lot more. But he was a very strict guy. Him and his wife ran this workhouse like a prison camp. The jobs that were done at Andover suggest that the reason this is called a scandal is basically because they were found out. Okay. 
it's like you hear about celebrity scandals. It's not actually about what they did, it's the fact, the fact they were found out and the fact what they did was really wrong. What did they do that was so bad? So first of all, they separated men and women and they had to wear uniforms. Straight away, this is very militant, it's very much run like a prison, especially this concept here. Now the separation of men and women, prior to this, men and women were actually allowed to be together. Um, under, in the Andover workhouse, they were separated. So husbands and wives that came together would have been separated. If they were caught talking, they'd be put into isolation. Once again, it goes down that militancy route, that militant route of Colin McDougall that really does cause problems for the people that live there. Had to meet with your fingers, so no basic hygiene, no basic knives and forks. This was a real problem. It's going to cause more disease, especially if you've been working in pretty horrendous conditions all day. I mean, you know some of the jobs that they had to do in the workhouse. But at Andover, it was very much a little bit worse than that. As I previously mentioned, if a couple was caught talking, they would be isolated. The best way to put it in terms of life at Andover was that the people were treated like animals. Now, when doing reading on this, it was quite, you know, quite shocking to hear about the main job at Andover Workhouse. One of the main jobs was animal, crushing animal bones for fertilizer. Now, Colin McDougall and his wife believed that this was a way for Andover Workhouse to provide for the community. This was a way for them to give back to the community. And it may also be a way for them to make a slight bit of profit from this. Because at the end of the day, that the, um, the Board of Guardians wanted people to run their workhouse as efficiently as possible. Well, the reason for this was very simple. The less a workhouse cost, the less it would cost the rate pay. A workhouse that was really, you know, that didn't spend as much was actually seen as a positive, but it came at the, at the detriment of their people. The diet was very limited. You know, I, there's, there's been a few things that I've read that calorie intake was as low as 500 a day, which isn't enough to survive. And for those people in McDougall and his wife's care, they only gave the minimum amount. They were more about making profit rather than helping those in need. Now, this is quite a shocking thing as well. Now, obviously, they received minimal quantities and any extra food that was given. So at certain times of the year, the workhouses will be given food. Christmas, during a coronation, which there was at this time. But the food was held back at Andover Workhouse. So any extra food they were given to give to the inmates of the workhouse was never given out to them. This meant, I mean, the food restrictions that they put in place kept the prices at Andover Workhouse minimal and it kept the Board of Guardians happy, as I mentioned, because the poor rate was low, meaning the rate payers would be pleased. Now, in the years 1837 to 1846, 61 paupers were actually sent to prison as they committed crimes so bad that they would prefer to, well, they went to prison instead of staying at the workhouse. What does that suggest? You know, I don't have to go into that at all, really. Life in a prison was seen as more appealing than Andover Workhouse, which suggests that there were all sorts of problems going on at this workhouse. OK, that's what life was actually like. And that's what you'd need to have an understanding of. Now, the essay we look at later does talk about conditions, but it doesn't go into too much detail about types of conditions. So this is where you would need to talk about it. A bit more. Now, the scandal. So, the next part of the table that I expected you to fill in. Now, I'm just going to go into a few more things about details about the, the life, and because it does link to the scandal. So, inmates were kept on the edge of starvation, so had to take extreme steps to survive the bone marrow. And we're going to look at an eyewitness account in a minute about one of the things and over workhouse. But sucking the bone marrow from the bones that they had to break, shows that the people at Andover Workhouse were desperate. They'd also eat the meat that was left over on the bones. So when there was a delivery of, um, of bones that they needed to crush, the first thing they'd do was try and eat the meat without being caught. And if there wasn't any meat, they'd suck on the bones to get the leftover marrow. 
Within this workout, fights would break out over meaty bones. The situation was horrendously traumatizing. Now, another thing that you could mention here, okay, just to add something to it, we'll just put this up here. You could also mention the inmates stole bones. They hid them. They would be punished if caught. Okay, so that's something you've got to understand is that they really did risk their own well-being from the, from the individuals at the Andover workhouse. During 44 to 45, there were rumours that circulated about the practice. So there, this is where the scandal begins. But this shows the weakness of the system that was in place. There were rumours that Andover workhouse weren't treating their the hawkers correctly. Now, obviously, I'm, I'm going to be aware, obviously, saying the word inmate makes it sound like a prison. Okay? But for all intents and purposes, this is what the people of Andover Workhouse were. They were prisoners because of their pauper status. And despite the rumours of 1844, the Guardians didn't investigate it, right? which shows that they really didn't have a care for the well-being. The only thing that the Guardians did do, they voted to ban bone crushing during hot weather. Whether that was policed or not is another thing. Whether that was checked up on is another thing. But it does show one thing. It shows that the Guardians, the whole concept of the Poor Law Commission was flawed. They only really cared about profit over assistance. Okay. Too much focus on how much provision cost rather than how much help it's providing. So that means they only really cared about how much they spent, not how much they were helping the paupers. So again, it goes back to the concept of punishing the poor rather than helping them. This is where the scandal goes one step further. Local farmer, Mr. William Harvey, Monday, took his concerns of Andover Workhouse to the local Member of Parliament. Now, this would have been brought up and this would have had to be followed. It was reported to the Member of Parliament and it would have had to be followed through, which means on the 1st of August 1945, there was a full investigation and he asked the Home Secretary about it. And this goes one step further. The investigation was undertaken by this man here, Henry Parker, who was a poor law commissioner. And what he found was exactly what we've just gone through. He found that actually the things were a lot worse than they were to believe to be because obviously Hugh Mundy wasn't there. Hugh Mundy would have heard things. Hugh Mundy might have seen some things. He would definitely not have seen some of the worst things that McDougall and his wife were doing. Some of the worst things that Henry Parker came about once he um, did some interviews was that McDougall was abusing the female inmates. He would beat them. And there were reports of sexual abuse, which again causes quite significant problems. And it makes the whole concept very, very flawed. And this does show the traumatizing aspect that McDougall and his wife had. This is where the scandal gets out into the public. The findings led to a public outcry, and the Poor Law Commission were attacked by the public, the press, and Parliament for failing to supervise the institutions. Okay, um, this led to some changes in the workhouse regime, and that's what we need to look at. So if you've got a question based on, if we look at the exam question that I want you to, how far do you agree that the poor relief in the years 1854 to 1870 evidenced a more positive concern for the well-being of the poor? Well, yes, quite obviously it can't get any worse for the people that were in Andover workhouse. But we will look at that in a bit more detail um, shortly. Now, this is an eyewitness interview that I found um, from one of the workers at Andover Workhouse. And I'm just going to point out a few things in this that might, you might be able to back up in an exam question. So it says, what work were you employed about uh, doing? Breaking bones. Straight away, this, this person uh, had it very, very difficult. Okay. Um, were there other people engaged in the same work? Yes. It was the only employment I had at the time I was there. So breaking bones was the only job that this person did. It would have smelt bad. It would have had poor hygiene. It would have really done some physical damage because of the sheer, you know, breaking bones is a difficult thing to do. Crushing them down 
enough to make it fertilizer would have been a very strenuous job. How many men were employed? Nine or 10 boxes around the room? It doesn't really recollect. So again, it would have been very cramped, very closed room. They were breaking it with a large iron bar. That again would have been very, very difficult, especially the smaller the bones have got, it would have got very difficult. Um, any other employment? No. It was the only job they did. Did you ever see any men gnaw anything or eat anything from the bones? I have seen them eat marrow out of the bones. It backs up what I was saying about sucking the marrow from the bones. Were you, were you not examined before the assistant commissioner? No. Whoever went into this workhouse just went in and they were never examined. Um, this bit here, did they state why they did it? I really believe they were very hungry. Starvation was rife at Andover. Um, did you yourself feel extremely hungry at that time? I did, but my stomach wouldn't take it. Now that's important because the more, the more people go through starvation, their stomach gets to a point of rejection of food. And that could obviously make you feel quite sick. Have a massive amount of protein in the long run. Did people steal the bones and hide them away? As I mentioned previously, yes, they did. Um, and this here, when the fresh set of bones came in, did they keep a sharp lookout for the best? It was a free for all. The moment people got the bones in, it was a regular thing. So this just shows you how serious the life at Andover was. And this was one eyewitness account. I'm pretty sure that most other eyewitness accounts would have been very, very similar. So then we look at the, um, the factors. What caused the Andover scandal? Now I gave you six, six, one, two, three, yep, six factors to look at. And I've gone through and I've added what I think you should put. So the first one, the new poor law. Again, I'll underline some of the key things. After the 1834 Amendment Act, just add there so you don't forget when we're doing this, 1834 Amendment Act, it put workhouses at the centre of dealing with the poor. Led to poor conditions in a lot of workhouses. Now, the point of the Amendment Act was to make workhouses similar, do the same thing. Obviously, we can tell at Andover that wasn't the case. Um, the central problem here, and this is the key thing, is that they were very, very expensive. And if there were, there were any corners to be cut, people would do it. And if shortcuts were being taken, health would be compromised by how much it cost to run the workhouse. Conservatism. Now, this was an attitude that basically, and we know this, we've looked at this in previous lessons, that the poor were undeserving. It could lead to poor treatment because the main reason was pauperism was linked to idleness. And if we just look at that word, idleness is obviously going to be laziness. And because of that understanding, that's why we had the deserving poor and undeserving poor. And the undeserving poor were very much linked to laziness. And you'd find a lot of undeserving poor, obviously, within the workhouse. It's really tough to change a majority's understanding, leading to poor treatment because a lot of people thought. It was the norm. It's probably why McDougall did this to the people of Andover Workhouse. Brutal treatment. I mean, don't need to go into this too much, but the key thing I want to point out here is that McDougall's interest in profit over the care of the people was the main reason why there was such brutal treatment. Individualism. Now, individualism, there's loads of people we could talk about here. McDougall, obviously. Hugh Mundy, the person that passed it on, the weakness of the boards of guardians. Um, and it also showed a weakness in the commission's role. They're not supervising things uh, well enough. OK, so any key individual that had a role in the Andover workhouse scandal is really important. But obviously, this guy's McDougall's treatment of people said it all. Economic interest, money over health. That's it. OK. Especially McDougall focused more on how much things cost him over health. And you could argue that the boards of Guardian here encouraged um, this because the lower the, the lower the workhouse cost, the less 
rate payers had to pay. And then you've got your media interest. So Times newspaper had a big part to play in developing the scandal, which we'll look at in a minute. The editor of the Times, John Walter, ensured the scandal was covered in great detail. And the greatest impact that the event had was to expose the abuses of the workhouse system and to force a change. People didn't like this system. Okay, there was a majority of people that really didn't want it and wanted it to change. This scandal gave it the impetus. Okay. Right, so I'm just quickly going to go back over what we've done so far. So we explain what happened at Andover and why it was so serious and evaluate the impact the Andover scandal had. Now, we're going to look at that next. This thing here, the factors as to why it happened, what happened and how serious it was is something we can definitely now relate to. So, I gave you some questions, and I'm going to go through the answers of these. Um, but again, this would help anyone if people were watching this, looking at how the scandal had an impact on the future of the workhouses. Please be aware that workhouses weren't removed because of this. There were some subtle changes in the management and the government intervention. Because remember, prior to this, Government had that laissez-faire attitude, which meant they didn't really want to get involved, didn't really want to develop um, any involvement because they thought things were well. So why was the Times newspaper coverage so important to the um, It brought it into the public eye. Spread the message of the horrible nature of some of the workhouses, or the way they did this. They got eyewitness accounts. Um, and that would have really, um, they would have really been sort of sold to the public as a horrible nature. Okay. Um, inmates were being, they saw, the Times newspaper said how inmates were being treated. And once this got into the public, it caused outrage. The man who was behind all of this was a man called John Walter, who was the editor of the Times newspaper. He made sure that this scandal was covered in every little piece of detail. Now, because of this, we need to question what happened to this group here, the Poor Law Commission. The Poor Law Commission, because of this scandal, was dissolved and they were replaced by a Poor Law Board. Now, this switch saw the end of the independent giving of relief as it was brought more under government control. Within this Poor Law Board, you had several cabinet ministers and the president of it was a member of parliament more control from the government, potentially less issues. So it was brought more under central control rather than independent um, commission that had the power to make sure that they were doing what the government wanted. The government set the rules, they weren't doing it. So what happened? The commission was dissolved. Now this is a little bit of a revision question, this one. What was so problematic about the 34 Amendment Act? The Amendment Act adopted the principle of deterrence. That was the biggest problem. This word here, massively problematic. Because the moment you start to say deter, it means you're trying to stop people being something or doing something. I mean, do you really think these people would have been poor if they had a choice? You know, it's punishing people for something that's totally out of their control. With this principle, you focused more on the fact that poverty was a menace to society, not something that could be dealt with. So it only sought to deal with poverty rather than actually deal with the whole concept of pauperism. How can we help the paupers out of this situation? The 34 Act put this strict regime into place it put the workhouses into a concept where they would be punished. And because of this, the 34 Act tended to put pauperism as an act of laziness. So I guess in 1834, they believed that by putting them into workhouses, they would teach them a new proactive way of living. But the problem was that these workhouses were somewhere that people would be until they were dead. Again, hence why they were known for prisons of the poor. Now, because of the scandal, the abuses at Andover, um, 
softened the strict attitude. And by the 1840s, there was this feeling of that paternalistic social responsibility once again. It made people realise that the old attitudes may have been wrong. Which, you know, thankfully, someone came, you know, they were started to get back to that old paternalistic way of thinking. What other reasons were there for a change in attitudes? Um, you had events such as Huddersfield that we'll look at later. Um, what the horrors of certain workhouses. Sorry, just realised something there. Make sure you add an S after the R. Huddersfield. Okay, just to be aware, so you don't spell it wrong in the future, like me. So events such as Huddersfield and Andover brought the horrors to certain workhouses to light. Now, this people made people feel that they had more of a social responsibility, especially the government and the Poor Law Commission. The only word that I can think of here, is there an aspect of guilt? Was there an aspect of, mm, we should have done this before? Who knows? But it made people more caring about it. Another reason why was that the what, issue of the workhouses was also a, something that was brought up by non-conformist churches. Now, a few people that have sent me this quest, these questions said that non-conformist churches were built. No, that's not the case. Um, non-conformist churches were ones that actually said that workhouses were wrong and weren't going to actually deal with the problem of pauperism. They were only going to punish it. The last five questions. Did workhouses get totally replaced? No. Between the years 51 and 66, 100 were built to augmentate, that means add to, the 402 which had been built after 1834. As I said, this didn't get rid of them. Got people thinking about how they were being treated. And the middle class, why were they a barrier to change? Now, a few people have sent me answers to this. And you nearly got there. But the middle class, Remember, this was after the Great Reform Act of 1832. I'm going to add that then because it's important that after 80, you under, understand that after 1832, the middle class were given the vote, which gave them more power. They did not really want to lose their new place in society. So a middle class lost touch of their origins. Previously to this, before 1832, the middle class would have probably watched out for their workers. But because they've been accepted into the higher areas of society, um, there was a tinge to this group that wanted to secure its own position rather than help others, which really wasn't what they were all about before 1832. So the middle class were a barrier to change because they didn't want to lose their place in society. Who was Henry Mayhew and what did he find about pauperism? Now, this guy complements the work that the Times did. As Henry Mayhew looked down the reason of why people became paupers. OK, I'm going to add that because I'm not sure if it's in. So why people became paupers. Again, help if I could spell. So Henry Mayhew was a journalist who published his four volume work and his four volume work was called London labour and the London poor. In this work, he said that it was the wages that led to pauperism because it was insufficient to protect the recipients from unforeseen changes to the economy. Right, let me just make that a bit easier then. Wages did not cover times of crisis. Economic depression. So people did get into um, aspects of pauperism, especially, you know, I mean, the South jobs were very, in, very sort of insecure, but the North, it all depended on the economy. The economy was, if the economy was good, then there would be a range of jobs. However, he realised that the wages weren't good enough. Okay. Um, the work challenged the belief that idleness was the real cause of distress. So basically what he's doing is, is going against what the 1834 Amendment Act had said. He's saying it's not laziness, it's the wages. And this, this was important. It's led to more charities being established outside and in workhouses 
we're going to look at this next lesson, okay? How did the conditions of the workhouse change because of this scandal? There's no, it's not too much that you can talk about here. It's going to get rid of this annotation. There were groups in the workhouse, um, the groups that were set up, such as the Workhouse Visiting Society, created in 1858. They'd make unofficial checks on the workhouse as part of the broader interest in giving out extra food and to boost morale. That was great because they could ensure that they were being treated properly, and if not, they could be reported. They were unofficial, okay, but nevertheless, they were a set of eyes that were making sure. The information this group collected was used to force change for better treatment. So basically, they were just a really good unofficial spy and they could look at what was going wrong in the workhouse. What was the, gov uh, the, the Huddersfield scandal of 1848? Now, obviously, this was after the Andover scandal. There was a typhus outbreak in 1848 and the Huddersfield workhouse became exposed to it. Now, typhus um, can be very contagious. Um, and it can kill people quite quickly, especially if they're living in poor conditions. Ill people were made to share lice-ridden infirmary beds with dead bodies and not get them changed for up to nine weeks. Showed lack of care from the masters and how the commission was not keeping up the standards they set. Obviously, this is going to then add more to that concept of a poor law board um, as the commission didn't do their job. Right. Just kidding. Just remove these. And the last question. I mean, this is open to interpretation. How important was the Andover scandal? I mean, the Andover, the Andover scandal changed some aspects. The Poor Law Commission was dissolved. The overall attitudes began to change to help more rather than have people die in these, quote, prisons for the poor. Without the outrage, would things have changed? Without the times? Who knows? Did things change quickly? No. Huddersfield happened after the Andover scandal. Without the informer, um, without the farmer, well, how long could it have taken for people to realise how things, how bad were things? The realisation of the weakness of the new poor law, I mean, that very much would happen because of the Andover scandal. But the key thing that I think you should understand here is that the Andover scandal created a multitude of factors, you know, many factors to develop further. And that led to these changes. Right? Hopefully that makes sense. Now, the last thing um, that I'm going to look at in this lesson is this question. How far do you agree that the poor relief in the years 1834 to 1870 evidenced a more positive concern for the well-being of the poor? Now, the, the responses I've received, I've been really impressed with. Basically, basically, positive concern for the well-being of the poor. Did it make their lives any better in the workhouse? OK. I'm going to show you one that I received. Um, now, I'm not going to give names or anything. I'm just going to show you what I received. This is what I received. This is only a part of the answer. I couldn't put it all on because it was over a page long, but it says, I agree that poor relief was evidence to more positive concern for the well-being of the poor. I'm going to tell you what's good about this response. First of all, direct focus on the question. As an examiner, that would make me happy. Okay. This is because in the years 1844 to 1845, the Andover scandal occurred. Due to the Andover workhouse being in poor conditions, now here, I just need more specific conditions. Nothing too big, just specific conditions. You can talk about the bone crushing, the marrow, everything along those lines. Um, Hugh Mundy took his concerns now straight away. Boom, loving that. Specific name. Makes me happy seeing that. Took his concerns to his local MP, Thomas Wakeley. Boom, another name. He can do interviews then. I'm liking that. OK, we, the more specifics, the better for this A-level. Thomas Wakeley, the fact that we've identified he is an MP. This is really clear. Due to the mass concern court, he then turned to his home secretary where a mass investigation was carried out. Um, so straight away, what we're seeing here is really good context. OK, context to the answer. 
shows good knowledge, not God knowledge, good knowledge. Um, which in turn is a really, you know, that's what we're looking for. And this, as I said, Henry Parker, who in conclusion said the investigation uh, deemed what was being said to be true and the owner McDougall was even accused of attacking the female inmates. The finding out this terrible work has led to public outcry and the poor law commissions were attacked by the public. This is where we're starting to address the question here. Okay, so I just underline that bit, the findings of this terrible, instead of crossing out, workhouse led to a public outcry and the poor law commissioners were attacked by the public. Crack him. The present parliament was also blamed for letting this happen for so long by not doing investigations to make the environment was fit for humane treatment. And this last bit here is what makes me really pleased. This was a big turning point for the public as they were starting to see how much people in poverty are having to put up with even the middle class who were taking a liking to conservative ways saw the institution was simply inhumane and this needed to change. The only thing I'd like to see here is just another reword of the question, but what I see here makes me really pleased because it does really address the question well. Okay, so that's only a part of a response that I received, but I'm going to do this a lot more um, so you can see real good practice on exam questions. Okay, so that's this lesson on the Andover Workhouse scandal. Hopefully it answers some of the questions that you've had. And um, this does integrate some extra reading to make so you have got that extra level and what the textbook has. And if you do have any questions, just let me know.